The first is focus. What is it that you do? The second is embed. What does your front line think you do? It's amazing how often they're very different and how people do not do strategy for the front line. And then how do you adapt over time? I'll try to give a couple company examples here, but also what happens with leadership. So focus, I, I'm going to keep using left and right brain. If you think left linear, right random, we won't get confused. I was confused for 12 years. Um, focus is a left brain thing. We all get it, right? It's where are we uniquely differentiated? What is it we do that's profitable and scalable? And what can we do that then we can repeat and transfer to other elements of the business? Leadership attributes of that are extraordinary honesty. Right? You have to brutally look at the facts. Bravery to take choices. I know there are choices on the red side. And ultimately be very self-aware because the organization isn't often nor is the external world giving you the information you need. I'll give you an example of focus is IKEA. Now focus starts with what are you trying to do? Right? I'm on the red side. Are we lowest cost? Are we trying to drive a loyalty game? Are we trying to drive an innovation game? Where are the portfolio synergies? Are we doing that, or are we playing an organization talent game? What is it that we're trying to do? Lots of examples of companies doing it. But what people don't do in focus is say, under that, what are the capabilities that we're trying to build in order to be competitive? And what we have found is companies that are good at focus are obsessed with the capabilities and talent that are part of that focus strategy. And this was our, our 15 box matrix of how to think about that. So if you look at IKEA, we all sort of get the movie of IKEA. The big secret is they make us do all the work. So we sort of get that. But at the center of IKEA is a very simple principle of strategy, which is we design great furniture to a price point. To be an IKEA piece of furniture, you have to be 35 to 50% below the price in the market at the time they do it. And the supply chain says they will get an additional 65 to 80% out of cost as they go forward. A non-negotiable for IKEA is there can't be an IKEA product without a price tag. Because it's supposed to be breathtaking when you look at it. So I was giving a presentation in Scandinavia to a board, a drinks company board. And again, common theme, they said, Jimmy, shut up. The guy who was head of their supply chain had just come from IKEA. And he told this story. The whole board discussion, I'm sure it's never happened with you, the whole board discussion in Scandinavia was initiative overload. Dear God, too many initiatives, our people are going nuts. We're dying under the complexity. So he got up and first described his job. For three years, he was in charge of air injection into particle board. His best friend was in charge of air injection into plastics. And one of his buddies, this is at IKEA, was in charge of cup stacking onto pallets. And you would have thought he discovered the cure for cancer with the enthusiasm he displayed to air injection into particle board, which is pretty cool. So if you take Billy the Bookcase, the iconic product, if you suck air out of particle board, you triple density of the product increase quality, and they do that around the screw holes, which allows them to add air everywhere else. And back to the value cost trade-off, or, or, or differentiation cost trade-off, every move they make on supply chain somehow has to increase quality and decrease cost in what they do. And that's what they've done again and again. And he said, at IKEA, you never hear the topic initiative overload. You never hear that, because there's a clear journey defined by their focus. And he then turned to this drinks company, and he, he had just joined them, so he liked them. And he said, we're sort of like a firework display. Our initiatives go up randomly, from our people's perspective, shine bright for a bit, and then drift down into nothingness. And everybody knows they can opt in or out. And he said, at IKEA, if it's good and it serves the journey, change is pulled. And if it has nothing to do with journey, it's ignored. And management gets fired if there's too much junk going out that has nothing to do with the journey. That is the power of focus. Just out of interest, the iconic product of Billy the Bookcase has gone down 85% in real price since introduced. And you can do that across their product line. But you guys kind of get the focus thing. Let's talk about the embed thing. I would argue that especially in Western Europe and North America, we are losing completely the importance of embed. And embed's a completely different thing. It's what is the nobler mission of the company? What are the non-negotiables? What are we agreeing we will do everywhere, every time the same? And what are the routines? The importance of routines. One of the things that all of strategy was built on, and you talked a lot about the red side of strategy, was a PIMS industrial database back in the 1970s. And what it did, you guys all know this very well, is it discovered that for, for companies that accumulate volume of manufacturing, over time, guess what? Their costs went down. And the analysis started to show 
that that was because you got better at ordering um, machine tools, you got better at running your plants and factories, et cetera, et cetera. So accumulated volume led to lower costs, which then said leadership should give you better return on sales. Therefore, there's a relationship between relative market share and return on capital. But the entire idea of strategy on that side depended upon a manufacturing model that none of us use anymore. And one of the issues on embed is if you haven't translated strategy into routine, you are by definition allowing no scale benefits in your organization. And it's amazing how few strategies get down to the routine side. But it's a completely different leadership quality. It's about collaboration because it's entirely working with the front line to create. It's about empathy because it doesn't matter what a group of people agreed on the left side focus is. What matters is what is the front line empowered to do? How do they own the strategy and what's the language for them? And obviously inspirational leadership. But this is a very different part of business um, in terms of repeatable models. I'll give you an example of Lego to bring it to life. Lego, everybody gets the movie. There's 60, there's 60 bricks for every man, woman, and child on Earth. Lego went through an terrible time. It expanded into a bunch of adjacencies, called itself a children's brand, which is always the kiss of death. Its core toy uh, was completely going under. When the new CEO came on board, the Christensen family, God forbid, told him he could sell it if he needed to, but he had a while to turn it around. He's just written a book on the turnaround of Lego, and he puts it all down to one thing, which is he discovered in the archives the original principles of play that founded Lego. And this was written in Danish, the right-hand side you see. And to make a long story short, he looked at that and went to his own people and said, do we believe Lego has a right to exist? Do we believe it has a right to exist? Look at those things. Should we be out there with our children? Should we be fighting to protect Lego? All the employees said, of course, we should be protecting Lego. Went to their consumers. Of course, the consumers said. Went to the retailers. And his observation was the only people that had given up on Lego were Lego. And he put all of the measures of principle of play into every decision that they made. Does this enhance it or does it retreat from it? This is the turnaround of Lego, which is extraordinary. And over and over again, we find that more and more companies are winning on the embed side through these extraordinary things. Just very quickly, the enemy of repeatability, obviously, is change. And so a repeatable model has to have something about fast adaptation. And adaptation is either just continuous improvement within the existing model, or really the, the stuff we were talking about before. What, how do you think about disrupting the model, changing the model, et cetera? Within the model, those of you who run in continuous improvement, the leadership attributes are obsessiveness and then consistency. But you have got to be consistent to this stuff. For changes to the model, which I won't go into because it was done so much better earlier, it's a combination of curiosity, what the hell's happening, and also endless paranoia about what's going on. But let me just tell you about continuous improvement with enterprise. So you all get the movie with enterprise. When I go to Western Europe and Asia, no one's heard of enterprise, interestingly. So it's the number one fleet car business in the US now, high single digit growth in a declining market, largest employer of college graduates in the US, CEO, founder, originally Chuck Taylor, had the best definition of business I've ever heard, which is the purpose of business is to get your customers to come back and occasionally bring a friend. They put in this whole system built around promotion. And the one thing they did is they, they're obsessed with what is the unit of value creation. And for them, it's a branch of 150 fleet cards. Every branch is measured on a promoter score. If you come in and you drop off the car, they say, would you use this again? If it's a no, they try to solve it within 24 hours. And every Friday, that branch reviews all the lessons. And every Monday, on a national basis, they review the lessons. If you're in the bottom third of branches, all the promoter scores are published. You're in promoter jail. And there's no promotions or bonuses until you get out. Fairly big deal. So the good news, this isn't about promoter, but the good news is their promoter scores went up. And actually, the variability um, between best scores and worst have actually closed, which is fantastic. But this is about fast adaptation. So you kind of understand the system they put in place. So one woman in one branch discovered that if she gave cold bottled water to the customers when they came in to get their car, and then when they dropped it off, her promoter scores went up materially. So in a company of fast adaptation, how long, think about your last change management program. How long did it take for cold water to be rolled out to every single business? 18 hours. 
Some people ask me, well, you couldn't even you know, distribute water to national branches that fast. It's like they went to Walmart and they bought bloody water and they took it forward. But that's about fast adaptation. And how do you get it so that the unit of value creation is entirely motivated by improvement on single scores and therefore move very, very quickly in the marketplace? So the interesting thing about this is we, as we started staring at this hard, one of the things that comes up immediately is that this is a return of a founder's mentality. As we have gone around the world, founders find that discussion incomprehensible. They don't know how to talk about strategy without embed. Right? And we all laugh, you know, strategy sophisticates laugh at these guys when they say, well, it's just about bloody getting your customers to come back and bring a friend. But they're just obsessed with all about this. I tell a story about this, which is how many of you guys know Pret a Manger, which is a sandwich shop in the UK? So it's now beginning to spread some in New York. Founded by a guy named Julian Medcalf. And its idea was we're going to serve good sandwiches with a smile, which if you guys know in the UK, neither of those things existed. Um, and I, I got to know Julian. And I, we're, our office is on the Strand. And we were overlooking a behavior that was happening, which is it had huge success. But then people, when Starbucks started rolling in, used to go to Starbucks for really good coffee and then just pick up a sandwich on the way out for their lunch, a crappy sandwich. And we were saying to Julian, Julian, you've got to do something with your coffee order because you're losing all of these people. And whether he was right or wrong, I don't care. But if the founder response was, Jimmy, we've looked at it, and our people stop smiling with complex coffee orders. And that's a founder mentality. They, I'm thinking where to play, left brain. He's thinking front line. And I would argue that in North American, Western European businesses, when you move further and further from the founder, we are completely losing this art. And the danger on a globalization basis is most of your Chinese, Latin American, Indian, and African competitors are still founder-led. And they totally get this. So I would use that as a big caution. Now you have to apply the repeatable model in a disciplined fa fashion. So when we're talking about repeatable models as it relates to your international strategy, we all sort of get adjacency expansion, right? You guys face it every day. And adjacency is all those discretionary moves you could make in business. I can expand as long well, distribution channels, my value chain, I could go internationally. And there's a rule about adjacency expansion, which isn't stupid, which is stay close to the core. There's a 75% failure rate with adjacencies, but if you just stay close to your core, it, you can increase that, that success rate by a third. The problem, and all of you have probably faced this, is in international expansion. Because international expansion is always presented as a step one adjacency. Jack, we want to go into Malaysia. And Malaysia sounds a bit different. Don't you worry your pretty head, Jack. Um, it's the same customers, same consumers. Everything's the same. Six weeks into Malaysia, damn it. Different price points everywhere. I'm not sure what to do. Eight weeks in. Channels of distribution, never seen anything in my life like what's going on with the general trade. And suddenly, the Malaysian international expansion is a step three venture capital move with the 5% success rate. And over and over again, what you see on international expansion is the lack of discipline. And M&S is a classic. So Marks and Spencer's out of, the, out of the UK. Very aggressive move into international expansion. Margin crushing. They had to exit all their businesses. And on reflection, it was one completely undisciplined store portfolio, less than 10 store density in every market they went into. No way to do it. All supplied out of the UK with no sustainable UK model. And every single thing ended up being different. And this, while we, we talk about it as I was stupid Marks and Spencer, I guarantee you all of you have had a couple of these. And this is the issue. How do you maintain the discipline? Then the issue is having an answer for the good enough segment. And the good enough segment is very interesting. So, and good enough is the red here. As you go into what's happening in emerging markets, the value creation is all in the good enough. There's wonderful premium positions that are fun and exciting and niche as hell. Then there are wonderful low cost stuff that is usually involves a lot of sawdust and rat hairs and you want to avoid it as an international company. And in the middle is this massive innovation going on in good enough. And you see it again and again as you go into these markets. And you can do the data. This Don't read it carefully. This is just looking at biscuits, understanding the international offer versus what you can offer if you were totally Indian sourcing. And you guys have done this. You can see why the low cost thing begins to emerge. But this is huge. 
we saw back in the 70s and 80s what happened in the US auto industry with the good enough segment and then what occurred. We are now seeing it completely in the um, communications infrastructure, almost the point of game over in what we're seeing going on. And now mobile handsets is starting to churn just like it. If you're a mobile phone operator now, I work with a lot of the Western ones, it's game over in a lot of Africa for them because they didn't move fast enough on the good enough segment. Where it gets into more purple range is this is a massive, massive opportunity for innovation. This is huge because if you guys, it's coming at you with founders and if you're not figuring out this, which will require you to completely change almost every model, you're going to be in trouble. So this is probably going to be where most competition occurs. Global talent, I'll just do this very, very quickly. You all kind of get it. One, in these markets, it's pretty hard to find, right? Lack of primary, secondary, tertiary education. You can go into lots of data, which I have as backup, which says everyone faces talent gaps in these emerging markets and retention is almost impossible because you're fighting a very aggressive equity market and you're often the trainers for equity holders, right? You find your companies having fantastic training programs. Everybody's looking and saying, we'll take anybody from Nestle, thank you very much, and offering them equity in a startup. So it's very, very difficult. By far, the best single strategy, as I said from the beginning, is you should be recruiting your African team now. You're too late on your Southeast Asia, so get going on it very quickly into all of your offices. If I wasn't a North American, I wouldn't say this was such guilt, but I find it hard to know why a North American company would recruit any more North Americans into the North American operation. And I don't mean, I, I'm, I'm blue team really, um, but um, you, don't, you can't afford to have people that aren't immediately mobile into your strategic priorities. A really interesting example of what a company's done to transform themselves on this is Unilever. And I'll just take a second on the talent side. So Unilever's goal is unbelievable, right? 75% of their revenue profit, 75% of their revenues is gonna come out of emerging markets got a CEO obsessed, CEO, CEO, CEO obsessed by this, and they're well on the path. They did something back in 2010 called a compass, which they've talked about in the marketplace a lot, which is all about embed. The compass was not about where to play, it was how to win, 12 non-negotiables, et cetera. But the interesting, one of their non-negotiables, which they talk about publicly, was we will only approve a revenue plan after we've approved the talent plan. Now think about your emerging market strategy. What the front line was saying when they came forward to co-create non-negotiables is we are so tired of approving revenue plan after revenue plan that presumed a commitment of resource that never came. So let's reverse it. And what that did to them was when they started adding up the numbers, they said, we have been competing in India as an Indian company, in Nigeria as a Nigerian company trying to recruit talent. We have to change the rules completely. And they went to global recruitment strategies and goals Unilever University is a completely different view and it's all down to kind of, you know, our African strategy depends on half of our new managers in Europe being African. And that is where you're going to have to go with the talent issue. If you try to solve it as a one-off, if you try to solve it as a one-year, you won't make it. Then stay paranoid. And the stay paranoid is be aware of the exact kind of change that's going on that Renee talked about because for everybody trying to protect their incumbency, there are very creative strategies going around the outside. And the pace of change is staggering. And I always like to show this just because I think it's so funny about pace of change. So to create the memory of an iPad using supercomputer technology of the 1950s would require a supercomputer the size of Cyprus. Okay, another way to look at it, which I think is even more fun, the memory used on the Apollo 11 project, which was supercomputers on the ground and a couple in the command module and the roving module, equaled five megabytes of storage space. One song. So I used to say, you know, the biggest iPods had 100,000 moon missions on it. It's actually down to the shuffle and I keep having to change. But literally, these kind of changes are happening to us every day. And the way we talk about turbulence is all around what is happening. It's exactly what is happening with people trying to change your, your space. And as you look at adjacency maps, if you're in tech, the biggest issue is every one of your adjacencies is someone else's core business coming right at you and they're facing this, but every industry is facing it more and more. And we tend to talk about three things of turbulence that you have to look at. One is, where is substitution for your product? It ends up being perfect substitution for what you do. And I often use a rule of thumb, how much of your time as a management team is fighting the future? 25% is allowed, right? And what an example of fighting the future is, a third of our customers are on contracts where the market price is now lower. Are you gonna go back and put them all on or wait? And they get a little pissed off. But, 
you've got, you're, you're always fighting the future a bit. But if more than 25% of the time is fighting the future, you're dead. And what does that mean? It means you all know your proposition for certain segments is actually not as good as what's out there in the marketplace. And you try whatever you can to hide that basic fact. And that kills a company. Or the profit pool shifts. You know, Dell did it in the early times in, in personal computing. Or it just goes away altogether, like if you're in the home loan market and suddenly it just disappears. So are there substitutions emerging? What's happening to profit pool dynamics? And then finally, is all this repeatable model he just talked about any more relevant? And the interesting thing about Kodak, I don't think there are a lot, is Kodak is one of the most perfect examples of all three of those things happening at once. Perfect substitution. Profit pool completely went different directions, and nothing Kodak did for a repeatable model had anything to do with the digital space. But it's hard to find such a perfect storm. But all of you are facing turbulence in some part of that that's going to require the blue ocean stuff we talked about. And a lot of times it can be game over before you know it. So industry, not very many of you follow, I don't think, but um, container, the, the cranes that are used for container shipping, almost overnight, game over to a Shanghai player. Founder, retired at 80, but even up to his 80th birthday, he was still climbing all over these cranes, single-minded purpose, blew away a global container market almost overnight. And you're beginning to see this kind of thing with this kind of turbulence. So the final one is just in this world where you've got this kind of turmoil, one of the big places for huge creativity is how you think about international partnerships. And I'm surprised about how much of this stuff is going on. You know, it, it, it's, you start looking at it, and it, it is amazing. So this is just a long example. You guys know what PepsiCo and um, ABI did? Completely started as a backsourcing deal where they just said, let's just join all purchases. You know, we'll get a better pencil deal. We'll get a better paper deal. They're now doing all media placement combined. Not media strategy, but media placement combined. And just said, why do we need to operate as one entity? Let's get together as a group. Huge thing that's going to happen. Kimberly Clark and Unilever, pretty fierce competitors decided to go complete joint venture in India. One brought nappies and Finman napkins, the other brought India. Um, you look at what happened with Hero and Honda in the manufacturing side, it ended up subsequently breaking up. But there was a very interesting time where it was all about Honda technology helping Hero as the leading motorcycle manufacturer. And you guys may know about this one, which is General Mills Nestle. I know there's some Nestle people in the room. But you know, this is pretty extraordinary. One provides a global market, one provides cereal, let's do things together form a single joint venture and drive it. And I think increasingly, the issue of how you use your global market partners is going to be as important. So I'll stop there. I wish I could be the blue team. I hope I represented the Soviet Union as best as I can in its future. Um, let me just stop there, ask, answer questions, talk about it. OK, well, first of all, thank you very much. Thank you.